Good afternoon, Cougar Nation. Welcome to a new edition of the Cougar Tracks podcast on kslsports.com. I'm your BYU insider, Mitch Harper. The long drought is over. BYU football is back this week, and we should all rejoice. It's an exciting time. We don't need to worry about conference realignment, at least during camp and the season. We've got actual football to talk about now, and we're going to be breaking down BYU football fall camp here in this episode of Cougar Tracks. It's Monday, August 1st. Here's a roadmap for what we've got on today's show. Like I said, Camp Kalani preview, breaking down the storylines, the positions of fall camp as the Cougars get ready to take the field later this week. You can follow me on Twitter at Mitch underscore Harper. Make sure to follow KSL Sports on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'm going to have a lot of content on all the different platforms throughout camp, throughout the season. So make sure to hit the follow buttons there. and. Subscribe to the show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at high noon. Talking BYU football, BYU sports here on Cougar Tracks on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and of course on the On Demand podcast. So subscribe to the show uh, wherever you get your podcast. Top storylines for Camp Kalani. It gets going this week. And let's just dive right in to it. Let me just say, BYU football in 2022, it's been a quiet offseason. And Kalani Satake, I think, likes that. I like. I think he likes the fact that this team has basically flown under the radar. But on paper, this could be maybe the best team of the Independence era. It's possible. That is something that could be achieved with this year's team in 2022. With how much returning production comes back. With all the pieces in place from the coaching staff. Think about this. Every coach returned. They're one of only five coaching staffs in college football to have that in place. And then you pair it up with the most returning production in all of college football by Bill Connolly's metrics, top five by Phil Still. There's a lot of reason for optimism for BYU football, especially coming off back-to-back double-digit win seasons. The big story, I think, though, for this team is it's the final year of independence. And I think a lot of focus in camp, though, will be on the defense. How does the defense respond after ending last year in such a lackluster fashion? Look, UAB was a good team. They were solid. They're UAB. They were just a handful of years removed from being on their deathbed. They were not existent. And BYU lost to them? Come on. It it left a sour taste for BYU on an otherwise special year. And I think they kind of took for granted that game and just thought, oh, they'll show up and they'll win. And they didn't want to be there. It was evident at at that Independence Bowl that week. I'm curious to see how the defense responds because there's been a lot of questions about uh, what they're going to be this year, how they're going to look, how they're going to line up. Defensively, the personnel, uh, a lot returns. Uh, Everyone of significance on the defensive line is back except Lopalea Tawa. Let's start there with the defensive line because I think a lot of focus will be on that defensive line unit. Eliza Tuiaki works with the interior guys. Preston Hadley works with the defensive ends. We'll start out on the edges. The defensive ends, you got Tyler Batty, who's the star of the group. Last two years, he's led the team in sacks, albeit pretty low numbers in sacks. I believe three and a half sacks a year ago, four sacks two seasons ago in a shortened year for him where he was dealing with injuries. Batty gives BYU the best chance to potentially get that double-digit sack total for an individual. Uh, It's crazy to think that BYU hasn't had uh, an individual record more than 10 sacks in a season since 2015. That was Bronson Kafusi, and Bronco Mendenhall was the head coach. I think never everyone just naturally assumed Sack Lake City is coming to BYU. Hasn't happened that way. And I don't think the sacks are the end-all, be-all, but... Dang, they're they're a momentum boost for a defense. They they give a lot of life to the crowd, the energy. Uh, If someone's going to get double-digit sacks, it's Tyler Batty, who I think is going to take another leap. I think he's a potential NFL guy in the future. I do. Uh, Another defensive end, you got Alden Tofa, too, who quietly, he's come back uh, to take advantage of the COVID year. He's been a guy that, uh, you know, I thought last season near, near the end, 
kind of came on strong and, and played quite well uh, for BYU. Hasn't had the decorated career that I think many, like myself, envisioned he would have. Uh, but he comes back to add depth. I think that a, a name to keep an eye on to me at defensive end that I'm excited to see what he looks like in fall camp because there's been a lot of years now in this program, I believe three years now, is Fisher Jackson. Uh, Harriman High School, I think as an outside edge guy, when Logan Fano went down with an injury with the ACL, and we'll, who knows the timetable on him, fingers crossed he can play four games this year and, and still maximize the red shirt. It creates an opportunity for BYU to, to find some maybe new guys to be in that hybrid linebacker OE outside edge spot. Fisher Jackson could be that guy to me. Third year in the program. He's been in the strength and conditioning with new Tafisi. I, I think that he's someone that takes a leap. Really good athlete, kind of in the same vein of, of Blake Freeland. I don't know what they do at Harriman High School, but they create these freaky athletes uh, that don't play the position uh, that they were going to play in college, in high school, uh, but they're kind of freaky guys. I think Jackson's a name to keep an eye on. Other names that interest me along the defensive line heading into camp, obviously Isaiah Moa, freshman. didn't He didn't stand out as much as maybe you would have liked from a four-star guy coming in in spring ball, but the fact that he's had an entire offseason to be with the BYU team uh, that lends itself to getting a chance to being in that top 10. You know, Elisa Tuiaki believes they go 10 deep, maybe 12 deep on the defensive line. And that's kind of an under the radar storyline that I don't think many people are acknowledging. Inside the walls at BYU, there's a lot of confidence about this defensive line that they're going to surprise people. It's going to be kind of a prove it until. I think folks are kind of on a standby approach with the D line. I, I know for myself, I'm going to wait and see how it looks in a game. I'm not ready to anoint them yet that they've arrived, but I do think they're going to be better than last season because of all this returning personnel. Uh, so Isaiah Mo will be a name to keep an eye on. Also, Lorenzo Fawatea. Lorenzo Fawatea comes back. He dealt with a ton of injuries in, in his BYU career to this point last year in fall camp. He kind of opened up about it on Twitter how he went into camp dealing with some back issues and he played through it, but that was not wise. And he had to shut down the season around the Utah state game and, and never came back. And it was another season ending shutdown for Zoe. He's now healthy. And you always point back to Zoe with that USC game in 2019 about his potential, what he can be. And that was in a drop eight, getting a three man rush. Zoe is one of those guys that has always been a talented pass rusher, just never been healthy. If he is healthy fully, uh, that lends itself to a, another nice piece of the D-line. The guy that is an upperclassman, though, and I've been singing his praises a lot this year because I think he's going to be really good. And like Zoe, he's dealt with a rash of injuries. It's Earl Mariner. Earl Mariner, one of the better pass rushers, too, on the defensive line. Even Elisa Tuiaki has said as much. I think Earl Tuioti Mariner could be a guy that after this season – could be maybe an undrafted free agent, maybe late round guy in the NFL. I think he's that good. Um, Earl Mariner has just dealt with a ton of injuries in his BYU career. The bloodlines are great. He's a cousin to uh, Travis Tuiloma. I think Earl Mariner, his return, taking advantage of the COVID year, which I didn't expect him to do, he signed back in 2014. So the man is, is an elder statesman in college football standards. Uh, but I think he's going to be really, really valuable for BYU. Nisa Mahe comes back at the interior of the line as well. Uh, Nisa was out during spring ball, dealing with a little bit of a shoulder issue. He's back fully ready, uh, excited to see what leap he takes. Again, all these names, you've heard them all, but what type of growth did they take on the defensive line? I think another guy that's going to take a big jump is John Nilsson. A lot of buzz about John Nilsson. Uh, media day, so many players, coaches saying the praises of John Nilsson. Lopalea Tawa, too. Uh, after he graduated and departed from BYU, he told me on an interview on KSL News Radio, keep an eye out for John Nilsson. He is an absolute stud. That's people inside the building. And John Nilsson played a lot last season as a freshman, cousin to 
Uh, Porter Gustin, good bloodlines again there. Josh Larson's another guy, kind of a, a Vasa gym workout guy who's transformed his body from what he was at Woods Cross High School to now. He is a completely different individual. He's over 300 pounds now. He's going to be in the interior of the line. Uh, Brooks Miley, Mike going to be a guy that could be out this year. He's dealing with an injury. Bruce Mitchell coming back. Uh, from a mission, I'm curious to see what he does. Kind of a small town kid, uh, you know. So, what can he do at the college level? Maybe more of a developmental guy down the road. And then some names like an Isaiah Perez, who's a, a cousin or nephew, I believe, to Eddie Keel, former BYU offensive lineman. So, some interesting names along the D line, along with Alema Pili Mai as well. Uh, another storyline. That piques my interest a lot going into Camp Kalani later this week. And again, share your comments on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook. If you're watching this stream, I can see your comments rolling through. The personnel that's going to shine in the Big 12 era. The Big 12 dynamic is interesting in this camp to me. It's still a year away, I get that. But for BYU, I feel like I kind of know who the top 44 are and I said that's basically the two deep on both offense and the defensive sides of the football I mean th there could be some changes but for the most part you pretty much know who the top 44 guys are so going into camp I'm kind of looking at this and thinking who are going to be those young guys that in 2023 if BYU has a mass exodus after this season who are those dudes that are ready to step up in 2023? It's a big fall camp, I think, for those guys. And I point to Jacob Conover at quarterback. This is a massive camp for him. Uh, talked about it on Cougar Sports Saturday over the weekend that I feel that he's going to have a really good camp to the point where it will instill confidence again in the BYU fan base that he can be a QB1 in the Big 12 era. Is it fair that... He's maybe getting a little bit knocked because of that performance against Utah State. Probably not. It's probably not fair because it's just a small sample size and the coaches really like him. But at the same time, there hasn't been much competition for him to really rise up and be the number two guy. Baylor Romney, gone. Uh, you know, Cade Finnegan, in incomplete, basically, in spring ball due to injury. Uh, he was in and out. We barely saw him a little bit. Uh, but not much during spring media observation portions. Soljay Mayava Peters is still kind of developmental. Aaron Roderick is saying the praises of him being one of the more improved QBs. Uh, but still, I, I think that Jay Conover is kind of not necessarily number two by default, but I, he's got to be clear cut delivering performances that says he can be a starting quarterback in 2023 and BYU should not have to worry about the transfer portal next off season. If he doesn't deliver amazing lights out performances in fall camp, Aaron Roderick's got to kick the tires on the transfer portal. You can't bank on Ryder Burton to come in and be the guy leading BYU in the power five era. You're going to have to go say, uh, find a transfer portal guy. So uh, I think this is a big camp for Conover. I think it's a big camp for guys like Jackson McChesney, Miles Davis. Uh, these, this camp, they're maybe not going to be the starters in 2022, but they can make a great case to be some of the future stars, some of the starters in 2023. That's a storyline that I think kind of piques my interest that maybe will be more on the back end of camp, uh, but it's always something that uh, I, I find interesting. Also, the health status of some key guys, Isaac Rex, Peyton Wilgar, Keenan Peely, Chaz Ayu. What's their health status? I think that's going to be something that needs to be answered coming in day one. You know, I think the, the narrative, Kalani Sataki at the end of spring ball, when I asked him about some of these guys, he said they'll be ready for the season. Uh, how ready are they in fall camp, though? Uh, you know, is Isaac Rex going to be a guy that's brought along slowly? Same with Wilgar, Peely. We'll see. Uh, because if they're fully healthy, those guys, they, they change a lot of BYU's depth chart. They change a lot of, how BYU operates. They're, they're key pieces if BYU wants to navigate this difficult schedule and they want to get 10 wins. They need these guys. Uh, you know, the luxury for BYU at tight end, though, when it comes to Isaac Rex, Dallin Holker was outstanding in spring ball. He was really good. You know, we, we tend to forget that back in 2018, I always point to this because it just speaks to his talent. 
He comes from Lehigh High School where he rewrote the record books with Cam and Cooper throwing him the rock. And as a true freshman, he goes in and week one, he's a co-starter with Matt Bushman, who the previous year was a freshman All-American. I mean, instantly, Dallin Holker was showing his talent right away from the jump. Really good football player, Dallin Holker is. Last year, Aaron Roderick noted that the coaching staff probably threw a little bit too much at him too soon. And meaning, comes back from the mission and how good he was in 2018. I think they just thought, he's ready to go. Let's, let's throw it at him. A little bit too much to handle. And now he's had a full year back. He's going to be really good this season. It's unfortunate for him that he gets to miss out on all the, the free COVID years. It would have been nice for last year to be kind of a free year for Dallin Holker. It almost feels like it, not necessarily a wasted year, but it just, he didn't maximize his abilities because when you come back from the mission, it's tough. Uh, but BYU still got to tie it in one, even if Isaac Rex is not fully healthy. But if Isaac Rex is 100%, you got a great one-two punch at tight end. It's one of the better tight end tandems out West. Uh, and that's a nice luxury for BYU to have. Linebacker situation. I think the linebackers are still pretty deep this year. Uh, I think that they're a, a, a spot, but you, you got to have Wilgar. Wilgar's the best of the bunch in terms of maybe NFL prospects, in my opinion. Keenan Peely was outstanding last season. I mean, the, the fall that BYU took defensively, when when Peely went down after that Arizona State game, it was pretty significant. And and that's where, you know, going back to the defense, you wonder how much of the issues last year were just simple, simply the injuries. Was it just that? Because when they played Utah and Arizona State with their best 11, they did a great job. And if they can stay healthy, uh, will it be a completely different outcome? So, uh, that will be interesting to see for, for BYU on the defensive side. Uh, but some of the other de uh, linebacker personnel, Pepe Tanavasa switches for over from defensive end back to linebacker a couple of years ago against Navy, his old school. He had a, I think it was what, 13 tackle performance in that blowout win over the midshipmen. Jackson Kafusi comes back. Max Tooley's back. Uh, Keenan Peely, of course. Morgan Piper, keep an eye on him. Uh, Piper is someone that... I expect to see a lot of run this season and probably a name that no one talks about, but I think he's going to see a lot of snaps uh, at linebacker. He's going to find a way to get on the field. Of course, Ben Bywater comes back. It's crazy. Bywater has been around since 2019 when he came back from the mission. Technically he's only a, a, a red shirt sophomore still. If he takes advantage of the COVID year, uh, Kavika Gagne comes back after the injury last year. Uh, he's a guy that, could be kind of in that Morgan Piper role, a little bit less lower on the totem pole than Piper. But uh, Gagne is someone that I think Kevin Clune uh, really likes. Uh, Michael Daly, excited to see what he looks like this season. Full year back from the mission. He redshirted a year ago. He dressed for the bowl game last season. But uh, by all accounts, he was just kind of a uh, get back to full speed. Talk about pass rushers. Michael Daly was one of the best to, to, to do it. Uh, coming out of the high school ranks at Lone Peak High School uh, in Utah County. So daily, he this will be another opportunity for him. You talk about those Big 12 youngsters. Daily, you want to see the big-time flashes from him in fall camp. Also bring back, uh, might bring in Micah Wilson, who comes in. He joins his, uh, his older brother, Josh Wilson. Mike is part of the program as well. And then return missionaries, Bodie Schoonover and Tate Romney. Uh, curious to see maybe where Bodie lines up. He could be eventually a defensive end uh, at BYU, depending on where his body's at. Coming back from the mission, Tate Romney is going to be super productive at BYU. Maybe not this year, uh, but down the road. His his talent is undeniable. Both of those guys are going to be really good in the future for the Cougars. Uh, so, you know, the, the health status is interesting. I think another storyline that I'm really curious to see, too, as we talk BYU football fall camp, here on the Cougar Tracks podcast every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday throughout the football season, throughout the year on Cougar Tracks at live at high noon. Uh, Fred Parker asked, who are some players that are not getting much pub on the offense that you think have a chance to shine this year? Good question, Fred. That's, it's always a great chance for youngsters in camp to, to emerge and, and kind of showcase themselves. I think maybe a Miles Davis uh, could have an impact. Uh, he was someone that was brought up last year before he suffered the foot injury. 
curious to see what Miles looks like again. Uh, Falau, Hinkley, Ropati, I don't think he should be completely forgotten. He's another one at uh, running back. Also, uh, on, on offense, so you want to go deep, sleepers, young guys. They're probably not going to play this season because of all the depth at the top, but uh, a wide receiver, Cade Moore from Lehigh High School. I really like Cade Moore. Also, Tanner Wall, too. Two walk-ons at, at, at wide receiver. Uh, those are guys that are good athletes. We didn't see Cade Moore in spring ball, uh, but Tanner Wall, there. He's a he's a good player, and if you want to say who could be maybe the next Dax Milne as a preferred walk on that rises to stardom, maybe it could be those guys. Uh, also, another preferred walk on that I'm really excited to see, kind of lay my eyes on in person is Dominique Henry, Dom Henry, one of the more productive receivers in the entire state of Florida last season. In the high school ranks because he was undersized. BYU picks him up as a PWO. And I think that's, again, when you talk about Big 12 bump, you get a guy like Dom Henry because you're saying you can play Power 5 football. Oh, you can come be a PWO, get an NIL deal where your schooling's taken care of. It's basically like a scholarship. And, and the, el the elevated uh, standard of walk-ons has been lifted up significantly under the watch of, of Kalani Satake. So he's another one. Also, Parker Kingston, a scholarship guy from Roy High School. We all know about the speed. I was talking to Fessy Satake about Parker Kingston at Media Day, and even he was like, his speed is, is undeniable. Uh, I, I would not be surprised if somehow he finds a way to factor into the return game because he's electrifying in, in, as far as speed goes. Uh, Parker Kingston is, is a speedster. Uh, another youngster on the offensive side that I'm curious to watch, Anthony Olson, another PWO. Olympus High School was once committed to Utah. Lips to BYU. Uh, you know, tight end spot to me, out of all the offensive positions, I think is maybe, I, I hate to even say this word, but maybe the thinnest because outside of um, outside of Isaac Rex and Dallin Holker, I feel like there's a little bit of a gap. I mean, Mason Wake could be more of a traditional tight end. That role could be utilized for him more in his game. That's that's a possibility. But you you like to have him in that fullback spot. Uh, Ethan Erickson could be a tight end three, but Anthony Olson, really good athlete, only played one year of football, uh, but the measurables, the, the speed, he's intriguing and curious to see what he looks like out there on the practice field too. And then Sione Vicoso uh, comes over from the transfer portal. He was contending for a starting spot, maybe an under the radar guy at Arizona State at the right tackle position. He comes to BYU. Uh, he's only a redshirt freshman. And what does he look like as far as the competition goes? Could he be a two deep guy? We'll see. So I, I think those are the young guys to me that aren't getting much pub that I would say uh, to maybe keep an eye on and keep keep note of going into fall camp. Tim Johnson, you might have addressed this before, but which athletes on the D might be looking at switching to O or vice versa because of their ability to contribute now? Good question. Uh, I was asking Daryl Funk, uh, about this on the offensive line, because I feel like on the offensive line, it's just a huge surplus of guys. Uh, you know, you, you can't really keep them all at offensive line. I would think, especially if you can maintain the health there, some of them maybe take them over to the D line. But from what I've gathered uh, and from basically the, the off season roster that we received, there hasn't been any real noteworthy position changes uh, per se on, on that front in the trenches. Uh, to my knowledge, as of right now. And now we could see something like a J.J. in Weegway situation where we show up to camp and day one, you know, he goes over from offensive tackle to tight end or whatever it may be. There's going to be those changes. It always happens. I, I mean, I would look at, you know, I, before I would have said Keanu Saliapaga should have gone over to the defensive line, but he's not expected now to be part of the team uh, this season, according to Kalani back in June. Uh, but, you know, I think that a lot of these guys, it's tricky, too, because they go through an entire summer conditioning program where they're building themselves up to have their body at a certain way or a certain, uh, certain weight, a certain look to, to kind of fit the mold of a certain position. And then to just have it maybe turned on them uh, would be kind of unfortunate. That's unfortunately been one of the things for a guy like Chaz Ayu, who I think is an interesting storyline coming in 
to camp as well. You know, Chaz last year sl got slim, trimmed his body down. He was looking great as a safety. We all saw it against Utah. He gets that interception. He was outstanding in the early part of the year. Then he gets the hamstring injury and he was out. But before that uh, injury, he, he switches over to linebacker in that Baylor game of all games to switch where Baylor, one of the best teams in the country, just physically dominated BYU's defense. And he's just kind of fallen to the point where I go, where's he going to play now? Uh, I expect him to be at linebacker based on where his body looks like. He's he's built bulking up. But I I'm curious to see what the situation is for Chaz because I just went through a lot of those linebackers and where does he fit on that pecking order? Is he a two deep guy? Is there, but I think that guys like Morgan Piper, uh, even uh, Kavika Gagne, they were all playing in spring. Chaz didn't go through spring. Talent wise, as far as being a gamer, Chaz is one of the better players of the team, in my opinion. And when he's at safety, I thought he was great, but uh, that didn't work out. So, and now at safety, BYU is going to go to a situation where I, I would expect it's going to be Malik Moore, of course, who had the most defensive snaps last season, and then probably Amon Hanneman, maybe Micah Harper. Micah Harper's still coming back from you know the ACL. He played in spring ball, uh, but still has a big knee brace on there. Hasn't played in a game since suffering that injury. Maybe bringing him slowly still. One of the hardest hitters on the team, Micah Harper is. But I think that, uh, you know, Ammon Hammond probably is the guy that wins that spot at uh, at strong safety alongside Malik Moore. Another offensive storyline for me going into camp, what tweaks does Aaron Roderick make to his high-powered offense? You know, what? how does he take it to an even higher level this year? Uh, I think last year, BYU's offense was really good. And they were honestly limited because the defense couldn't get off the field enough on, you know, third and fourth downs. It probably took away maybe two or three drives a game, maybe. Uh, you know, it, it just, and you think of that, an extra 14 points potentially, or maybe an extra 10 points against UAB, you win that game. So I'm curious to see what tweaks the offense does make uh, because Jaron Hall was outstanding in spring ball. The accuracy on his throws, the velocity behind his passes. Expect a big year from Jaron. I don't think he's the best quarterback in college football. I know that Aaron Roderick said he wouldn't trade Jaron for anyone. That's fine. I mean, I I still wouldn't say he's better than C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young or Caleb Williams, but uh, Jaron Hall is dang good, and he's going to rise to be, I think, one of the better quarterbacks in college football this year. I. I think he's going to be outstanding, and I think that uh, if he's healthy, he will he will put up some big numbers. Now, Aaron Roderick's the type that he's not prideful that he needs to be fulfilled by scoring 40 points a game. He's content winning 24 to 17 if need be. If that's what it calls for, fine. That's all right. And I think that's why this coaching staff works so well is they don't have these agendas where they need to win a certain way, just get the win. Uh, but I think this offense, though, I, I you just like I think it, it well, how great would it be for BYU if you produce a quarterback that once again goes into the first round of the NFL draft? Think about that. I mean, I know it's not about this season, but just you go into the Big 12 where you're saying you've had back to back first round QBs. You haven't had that happen since Mark Wilson and Jim McMahon. That's in the four. That's, that's about 40 something years ago you've now revived the quarterback factory. Uh, I, I just think that there, there, there's a fine line too, I think with, you know, just trying to get in the win, but also giving these guys a chance to really showcase their talents too and you know, put up those big numbers and, and uh, production, those off-platform throws. Jaron's going to make some big plays this year for BYU. I'm also excited to see the running backs. Christopher Brooks, I think he's going to be outstanding. I don't want to say he's going to be replacing Tyler Algier, but I think he's going to be a great fit for what BYU does offensively. And it's not a surprise that Aaron Roderick said he's going to be that first running back taking the snaps against South Florida. I mean, he, he, he was head and shoulders above everyone uh, in, in spring ball, and he's going to be really, really good for BYU. Freshmen are always a key storyline heading into fall camp. Here's some of the freshmen that, I'm curious to watch and some new faces that uh, are kind of piquing my interest going into Camp Kalani. 
Number one for me is Corbin Green, cornerback. This dude, to me, I think is going to be in the top four cornerbacks. Top two, Caleb Hayes, D'Angelo Mandel. Three, Gabe Judy Lally from Vanderbilt. He, he might be a starter, Gabe Judy Lally. I wouldn't be surprised if he pushes either D'Lo or Caleb Hayes. Judy Lally's going to play. I think the fourth guy, though, is Corbin Green. At a Tulsa, Oklahoma, Big 12 country prospect. Signs in the February signing period. And General Guilford said he, out of the newcomers coming in from the freshmen, the high school guys that they signed, he's the most pure corner out of the group. A lot of these guys maybe take a similar road of a Malik Moore trajectory where developmental, and they want to turn them into defensive backs because Zion Allen, Nathaniel Gillis, uh, Evan Johnson, more of a track and field backgrounds, that not necessarily – Tons of film on D at DB, whereas Corbin Green's always been a DB. He's got the confidence. He's got kind of the swagger to be a cornerback. I think that takes a certain attitude to play that position. That's Corbin Green to me. I I'm very high on the prospects of Corbin Green. He's the number one freshman that I think is going to make an impact. It's becoming tougher than ever for true freshmen or newcomers to make a dent in BYU's program, and that's a testament to the depth that Kalani has built in his program uh, and just how they've they've maintained their personnel. You know, all these other programs in college football, they're dealing with these headaches of the transfer portal. The transfer portal was not a headache for BYU. In fact, it was a it was a boom. I mean, they they utilized it to, you know, maybe the numbers crunch situation where, hey, this is the deal. This is the reality of where you sit on the depth chart or where you sit on the roster. Probably in your best best interest to move on or go into the portal if you want to play. Those tough conversations happen. BYU didn't lose anyone in the portal that you thought, oh, that's a too deep guy, other than Baylor Romney. And he was already a fourth-year guy, already graduated, so you can't fault him. He doesn't want to be a backup, and he's moving on to work at Adobe. Where then you add Kingsley Suamata'ia, you add Sione Vicoso, you add Houston Haymuli, you add Gabe Judy Lally. I mean, BYU had a very successful year in the portal. And for these newcomers, it's just difficult because you got a lot of upper class and you got a lot of experience returning. Corbin Green, though, excited about him. Zion Allen, Evan Johnson, Nathaniel Gillis, M Maury Bamba. Uh, curious to see what all those dudes look like. Uh, I'm also curious to see maybe an Enoch Nawahine from Utah State transfer portal guy. What does he look like as a running back? Kind of like it reminds me a little bit of Harvey Unga on film, but he's a deep, deep sleeper guy uh, on, on the roster. I'm trying to think of some other freshmen to that are new faces that I'm curious to see. Uh, Talent Togiai, offensive lineman. I, again, I, I really like the offensive line personnel. Isaiah... Or Vice Suifua and Peter Falanico. BYU's got some studs on the O line. They they are loaded. Peter Falanico, I brought him up over the offseason, 17 years old, and he looks like a grown man already. <laughs> I saw him over in May, and I was stunned that was him. I was like, whoa, that, that's that's Falanico, man. He he is a impressive looking individual. Same with Vice Suifua as well. Let's see here. Just the thing is, too, I'm also excited to see just kind of be back to to fall camp and make it feel a little bit normal. We haven't got the official, we in the media haven't got the official schedule yet, uh, but I'm just kind of excited for a full year of BYU football coverage that maybe feels a little bit back to normal. You know, I, I got to KSL in 2019, and since I've been at KSL, it's been pretty much mired in the pandemic. You know, dealing with a lot of Zoom calls, things like that. I'm just excited to have a little bit more face-to-face -face interaction. It was so great during spring ball to have that. I'm looking forward to that to this this year as well. And I just think it it, it adds a a richness to the content, to the coverage for you, the fan. And there's no greater joy in my life uh, other than my kids and my wife. I I admit, but uh, you know, to give you guys coverage that you care about. You know, because I I know what it's like being in your shoes and waiting for info and details. It's like, I want to give you coverage that you care about and cover content that you want to know and make you feel like you're part of fall camp practices. Because I, I know that with fall camp, it's, 
there used to be a time where you could just go. You could go on the balcony at the student athlete building and be there at practice. And now, you know, it's it's in this day and age of coaches are getting paranoid more than ever and things like that. It's tougher for the fans to have access. So, uh, you know, feel free. Whatever you want to know about BYU football fall camp, you can hit me up on Twitter or also at, at uh, mharper at ksl.com on email. So I want to give you guys content that you care about. And I, 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 that's what makes BYU fans so great. And why I enjoy this type of stuff is that, uh, you know, this is a passionate fan base and everyone cares round the clock. I see it in the off season. I see it with the, uh, the readership and BYU football fans care a ton. And I want to deliver uh, fall camp content that you, the fans care about and want to feel informed going into this 2022 BYU football season. So I think that's maybe the biggest thing that I'm excited for is just kind of having a little bit of normalcy once again, and having that face-to-face -face interaction with these teams. So it's going to be a lot of fun, but I think that's going to do it for this edition of the Cougar Tracks podcast. I hope all of you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to the show on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're so kind to do so, uh, leave a five-star rating. I would appreciate it at that a ton. If you don't want to, it's fine. Just subscribe. Uh, but if you leave a rating, that would be great as well. I'll be back on Wednesday talking some more BYU football, maybe a final check-in before camp, and then we're off and running with BYU football fall camp. Talk to you next time here on the Cougar Tracks podcast. It's always powered by kslsports.com. Oh, 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 o